Thanks for having me. You all won the lottery. You're here. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my family's story. It's a story of faith, story of Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you, especially to Karen, to Melody for the invitation to do this. Uh, they bribed me with homemade jam and brownies, <laughs> and it worked. So here I am. Um, you know, before I, I was doing this a few weeks ago, a Jesuit said to me, I see that uh, on the pamphlet there, you're giving a talk on refugees and migration. Uh, and I said, yes, I am. And he said, so are you pro or against? And I said, well, whether I'm pro or against, I'm the product of it. <laughs> and then another Jesuit, he said, hey, I see you're giving us the agape latte. Uh, what are you going to talk about? And I say, I don't know yet. I'm not sure yet. I'm really nervous about it. And he said, just tell jokes all night and send them off. <laughs> Y'all ever hang around Jesuits? They're so snarky, right? So snarky. They're helpful if they want to be, right? So here are some questions for y'all to keep in mind uh, as I share my family story. It's not really my story only, but it's my family story. Uh, and here are some questions to help y'all uh, stay grounded. Where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and a foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? Those questions are for all of us. I want to start off by uh, acknowledging that I cannot do justice to what all the Vietnamese refugees went through, you know? Some of you have parents who are Vietnamese refugees. Uh, not in 20 minutes, not in an eternity. Uh, the experience of leaving a war-torn country and starting from scratch again. Most families, like my mom's family, left Vietnam in 1975, right? Right when Saigon fell to communist rule. And my mom had just finished high school. Uh, they got out of there, right? The world was falling apart. Uh, talk about not having time for a graduation, right? <laughs> Got to pack up and go. And my dad's family was stuck back in Vietnam until 1980 under the new regime. Now, one of his brothers was a soldier and was killed in battle. And his dad, my grandfather, also died that same year he was killed. So my dad buried his dad then buried his brother, and then helped his mom escape Vietnam in 1980. The world was falling apart. My dad recalls sneaking out on a motorboat with his mom and relatives with about 40 people. So they all packed into this little boat, like sardines, kind of like that powerful statue you saw in front of O'Neill, right? They were attacked by pirates at least twice, barely making it. Many people lost all of their family members. And I cannot do justice to their stories here. Also, I cannot do justice to all the experiences of the many young Vietnamese Americans who grew up here after the war. Those who came as children, like my aunts and uncles, those like myself, and some of you here probably, uh, who were born here. The many who strove and struggled to belong, to find a home in several different worlds and different cultures all at once. So there are shared experiences, shared joys, and shared sufferings, but there are also many variations, right? Some people like myself are blessed with the opportunity to share my family's story. But others will never have this opportunity. I want to remember them and honor them here this evening. So as I was preparing this talk, uh, this scripture passage from St. Paul kept coming to my mind. Rejoice always. 
Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. That sums up the migration stories I will share with you this evening. And that message is for all of us. And I understand that, you know, migrant and refugee are uh, different things, right? Different, different situations. Since refugees were forced out of their home due to war and persecution. But I think migration, right, in the broader sense, applies to all of us. We're all seeking to belong, seeking refuge. We continue to migrate until we reach our ultimate destination, which is what? Ultimate destination. Good job, theology department. Heaven. <laughs> our ultimate destination with God in heaven. Fun story, a few years ago, I was greeting parishioners after Mass, and I was a relatively new priest and was helping out at this parish, right? And this man came up to me, and he goes, Father Tron. And I was like, what? What? Yes. <laughs> I know you. And I said to him, I looked at him, and I said, no, you don't. <laughs> he said, yes, you called the chancery office, the bishop's office yesterday about your visa application. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't say it. <laughs> I said, why would I need a visa? And he goes, well, everybody coming from another country needs a visa. And I said, but I was born here. <laughs> and he looked at me as confused as an armadillo crossing the highway. Right? He paused and he said, Father, are you sure it wasn't you who called? I said, No, it wasn't me. <laughs> and then another time, again after Mass at another church, a woman came up to me and she said, Oh my goodness, Father, your English is so good. What country are you from? Where do you learn English? And I said to her, ma'am, I'm from the Wallens. <laughs> Get that drawl in there. I'm from the Wallens. Now, to her credit, New Orleans is kind of like a different country, right? <laughs> so where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and a foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? So I was born and raised in New Orleans, the oldest of four. My parents met in the church choir in New Orleans, right? You know, who needs dating apps when you could join a church choir, right? But don't take dating advice from me, because <laughs> here I am. <laughs> join the church choir after COVID. Any of y'all been to New Orleans before? No? No, yes. Um, very colorful city, very Catholic, very jazzy, very voodoo, very drunk, as you know. Usually what comes to mind when people hear New Orleans is the French Quarter, Bourbon Street, Mardi Gras. Don't go to Mardi Gras until you're 30, okay? When the prefrontal cortex is all formed, right? Uh, not a lot of people know that not a lot of people know that there are a lot of Vietnamese people in New Orleans. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that? Y'all got to go visit the Vietnamese when you go to New Orleans. And especially in New Orleans East, a predominantly African-American area of New Orleans. Now, many of the business there, a lot of the restaurants, the pharmacies, we got a lot of pharmacies. The Vietnamese got a lot of pharmacies. The restaurants, Creole, Cajun, Viet mostly owned by Vietnamese people. And you probably heard that after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, there was an influx of Latin and Central Americans coming into New Orleans East. Very colorful area. Y'all gotta go. 
And the Vietnamese were one of the first people to return to New Orleans to rebuild after Katrina when they became, in a sense, refugees again. Now, Vietnamese refugees arrived in New Orleans over 45 years ago, almost half a century now, thanks to organizations like Catholic Charities, Jesuit Refugee Services, and Archbishop Hannon, who confirms me for my confirmation, uh, welcomed the Vietnamese people and the majority of whom were Catholics. Uh, when they first arrived, many white people didn't want them. Many black people protested their arrival. And ironically, above all, it was Vietnamese people who chased their own people out of their homeland. So in New Orleans, the refugees faced new challenges of racism, discrimination, and gun violence after all they've already been through. At the same time, there was so much to be thankful for. The first Vietnamese Catholic pairs, parish in the United States of America was established in New Orleans East, Mary Queen of Vietnam Catholic Church. It was the fruit of the faith and labor of the many men and women who were still mourning their old home and longed for a sense of belonging in their new home. And they built the church. And the first Vietnamese American bishop also came from this parish in New Orleans. So our lives revolved around the church, right? Faith gave people purpose and meaning to fight and move forward. And for many, the church, warts and all, was the springboard for their future endeavors. So the Vietnamese community in New Orleans East is made up of survivors. And I came from this community of survivors, many of whom were refugees more than once. So where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? Now let's move back a little bit. I, my conversation with you just now, this might resonate with you. <laughs> my maternal grandparents had 13 children and my uh, Paternal grandparents originally had 11 children, right? And someone once said to me, the Vietnamese are kind of like the Irish, but with better food, right? And I said, that's not saying much, right? You got corned beef, and then you got pho, <laughs> spring rolls, bún bò hue, mánh thịt nương. You can't even compare, you know? <laughs> so kind of like the Irish. My grandparents were originally from North Vietnam, right? And in the early 1950s, when the communists took over the North, many, especially the Catholics, left everything behind and fled to the South, right? My parents had not been born yet during the first migration. And some of our relatives made it out of the North, and many did not. Families were separated. My great-grandparents were not able to leave. Some were imprisoned, some were killed. My grandparents never saw their parents ever again. During my maternal grandparents' journey from North to South of Vietnam, they carried with them this silver crucifix, you know? They didn't carry much else but they brought with them the symbol of their faith and their purpose. Many families, not just my family, were carrying crucifixes and images of Mary and the saints with them. It was a reminder to them, regardless of what happened next, and who knew what was gonna happen next? Whether they live or die, they knew where their home was, they knew where their refuge was. 
So the silver crucifix that my grandparents carried, the sign of triumph of life over death, today it sits in the center of my parents' house in New Orleans East. Now at my parents' house in New Orleans, they have this huge shrine, right? In the middle of their living room. And almost every Vietnamese Catholic has a shrine at the center of their house if you come visit. Uh, it's where the family came to pray in the evening. It's where we kept the images and statues of Christ and the saints. We got the holy water, the relics, Lord's water. We all stuffed this little altar with everything, right? Hack it with the saints. <laughs> all the saints you can name. Uh, and my mom would, <laughs> she has this habit where she would go to the store from time to time, and she would bring back another saint to put him on the altar, right? And my dad's like, another one? <laughs> and she's like, well, Mary looked lonely, so I got to bring her home. <laughs> she looked lonely. St. Francis looked a little lonely today. I have to bring him home. So among all these beautiful images and sacramentals stood the silver crucifix that migrated from the north of Vietnam to south of Vietnam and eventually to New Orleans East. So where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? After leaving the north, my grandparents settled in South Vietnam. My parents grew up there, and in 1975, as you all probably knew, the communists invaded the South. It's like, oh man, we just got here. <laughs> we gotta leave again. My maternal grandmother had just given birth to her 13th child, just gave birth. There was no time to pack. Everyone had to rush to the boats and the ships before the Americans left. And my mom, who just graduated from high school, grabbed a small suitcase, and instead of stuffing it with clothes and other possessions, what would you stuff it with, right? What did she do? She went to the family altar, and she stuffed it with Mary, Jesus, a crucifix, that silver crucifix that our grandparents bought from the north, put it all in that bag. Again, other families did a similar thing. One of our family friends said that during the invasion, he was 12 years old. And he ran with this statue of Mary half his size. And while bullets were flying past him, right? He and my mom and many others, they testified we thought we were carrying Mary, but she was carrying us. You know, we have a statue of Our Lady of Refugees in my home parish in New Orleans, uh, brought over by a refugee woman. Didn't bring anything else but this statue of Mary. We thought we were carrying Mary, but she was carrying us. As my parents, and siblings, as my mom's parents and siblings headed to their ship, my mom's eldest brother, the oldest of 13 kids, he changed his mind and decided to stay. Why would anybody stay? The boat to freedom is right there. And he's like, I cannot leave. Why would anyone do that? He was a young seminarian, maybe a year or so from ordination, the oldest of 13 kids. His mom, my grandmother, begged him to leave for America, to come with the family. But he said, mom, who's going to keep the faith? Who's going to keep the faith? I have to stay. So grandma was crying and begging him to get on the boat, to leave with her. Come to America, you can be a priest there. But he stayed. 
His parents and 12 siblings left without him, and he never saw his parents again. They both passed away a few years later. So the communists took over. The officers took, brought my uncle in for interrogation. And they told him, hey, you know what? We see here that your dad helped priests escape this country. Your entire family left for the States. You'll never become a priest in this country. Go home and start your own family. And he told them, God has called me to this life. I'll stay celibate forever, even if I can't become a priest. And they said, okay, bye. So for over 20 years, my uncle served as a catechist and a Eucharistic minister for maybe 4,000 families. He would sneak bread and wine into the prisons where, you know, all the priests and bishops were arrested and put in, right? He, bring, he puts uh, wine into the soy sauce <laughs> bottle there. So he got some soy sauce here for the priests. <laughs> got some crackers here for the priest. <laughs> they would consecrate it and they would sneak it back out and he would bring communion to his parishioners. Bring you the Eucharist, bring Jesus to his parishioners. And many others like him did the same, living out their, the priesthood of their baptism when the world was falling apart. Now, his own bishop, Archbishop Francis Xavier Nguyen Van Thuyen, who is on the way to sainthood now, was in prison for 13 years. No reason to be arrested after 13 years, no reason to let him go. But now he's on the way to sainthood. Over 20 years later, my uncle was finally, finally allowed to be ordained and was able to come to the United States for the first time to celebrate a mass of Thanksgiving. And I remember greeting him at the airport. Do y'all remember when, y'all probably don't, but we were able to go inside the gate and watch the plane land and, you know, we went to go pick up my uncle. Can you imagine? I was 13 years old or so. And I was just in awe before our family hero. He kept the faith. He fought the good fight. Even when the whole world was falling apart. Some of his siblings, you know, seeing him for the first time since 1975. And tears of joy and pain and Thanksgiving. And of course, one of the first places he wanted to visit was his parents' grave. And there his tears showed us how much he suffered all those years. But in his homilies and speeches in subsequent weeks, his sisters threw him a huge party, you know? Welcome, you know? Congrats, praise God. In all his homilies, in all his speeches in subsequent weeks, he kept repeating, all is grace. We live for the next life. All is grace. We live for the next life. So where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and a foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? While I was studying in Beijing, I had the opportunity to visit my uncle in Vietnam. The first time I ever went to Vietnam. He took me to see my grandparents' former home, which is now a post office, I think. But what a blessing to go to the place where my parents were born, their first home, 
where they were baptized, attended their first mass, recited their first Hail Marys, first heard the name of Jesus. And then in 2015, my uncle flew back to the U.S. to attend my old ordination. It took me 13 years to become a Jesuit, right? We're supposed to be doctor of souls, supposedly, right? And my uncle used to say, you think your formation is long? <laughs> my priestly formation took over 20 years. My first Thanksgiving Mass was partly in English and partly in Vietnamese. He was seated right next to me in the sanctuary. Hundreds of our relatives and friends came to pray with us, to give thanks. It was a blessed and beautiful day. And he preached in Vietnamese about how God brought me to the Jesuits. And then I went up and it was my turn. And I preached in English about how God's grace working in his life inspired me. So where is home? Where do I belong? When am I no longer a stranger and foreigner? Where do I seek refuge? And to end, you know, I've, I've been a Jesuit for almost over uh, 20 years now. Almost 20 years now. God has spoiled me. I'm like a spiritual brat. <laughs> You know, I've been to, I've been missioned by the Jesuits to Tijuana, Mexico, to New York, to Beijing, Macau, California, Belize, here. But no matter where I go, when I come across a Catholic church, see a rosary hanging on someone's rear view, rear view mirror, seeing someone on the bus or the plane, making the sign of the cross, looking up at a crucifix and other symbols of our faith, statues of Mary, Joseph, and of saints, or celebrating mass, regardless of the language. I feel at home. I remember that all is grace, that we live for the next life. And others can question my belonging but they don't belong here any more than I do. So in a sense, we're all migrants seeking refuge. How we keep moving forward depends on where and in home we find refuge. I grew up hearing stories of war and migration, uncertainties and fears, worlds falling apart from my relatives and friends. But they almost always ended their telling and retelling of their stories with thank you, God. Thank you, God. Where would we be today without our faith? Thank you, God. So rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you, in Christ Jesus. Thank you.